installment of Tonight Live with Tony Bellow. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining. You left my phone at your house. Uh, what? <laughs> you left my phone at your house? Oh, I fucked up already. This is why we're getting cancelled. <laughs> oh, friends, thank you so much for joining us. Tonight is just us. We've got no setup, guests, no band, and frankly, we have no jokes. Today, we did nothing, baby. We spent the day stealing stationery and doing heroin. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, of course, it was uh, ABC heroin, which is just sniffing the clag glue from play school. It's, uh... <laughs> That's the good stuff. All right, fuck off. <laughs> uh. Well, we've had a great run at Tonightly, everybody. Have you all enjoyed Tonightly? You had a good time? You like it? <laughs> I've loved it. You know, it hasn't all been good. We've had a tricky run. We've gotten into trouble over the years, over or over the months, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> over the months, <laughs> almost twelve. Um, <laughs> we got in trouble because, as you know, I'm a bad little boy. But whether you like us or not, I think we can all agree this wonderful thing that we live in a country where we have a show like this, and people are uh, free to uh, criticise the government. I think that's great. Not everyone's so lucky. There's a story today about how in Saudi Arabia, people who post satire on social media can be jailed. If you criticise the government in Australia, the worst thing that can happen to you is you get in trouble with Cory Bernardi. <laughs> <laughs> or as we call him around these parts, the C word. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> That's just what we call him. No, but if I... Yeah, just be serious for a moment. Like, this is serious. This is the world right now. The world is in a very scary place. And we need comedy. We need satire to happen, and we need to start those conversations. <laughs> we need satirists to shine spotlight on the issues... Of our t Sorry, mate. You're right. <laughs> hey, mate. You're right. Wait, what? You're right. Hang on. We've got to talk to some guy. Tom Bella. That's who you're talking to. Hello. You're right. You, you've all got to come down, mate. What? Yeah, we need the wood to make coffins for ABC viewers. Coffins for ABC viewers. <laughs> no, that's a bit dark. What? Why are they? <laughs> you can't do that, hey, mate. Hey, no, hey. I, I can't hear you when I'm drilling. Yes, you're drilling all the time. Stop drilling. So Stop keep drilling. Keep talking when I'm using the drill. Uh, yes, I understand that. Can you fuck off? We've got a show to do. We're still going to finish it, all right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, sorry. Now, as I was saying, as comedians living in this political climate, it is our, it is our job, not our responsibility. What are you doing, mate? Are you, are you right? I've just got to get your mic. Well, I need my mic to keep talking, don't I? Is that correct? <laughs> what the fuck are you doing back here? Yes! Yes! Find the desk! All right, no, stop clapping, everybody. Right. Fuck off. OK, well, I was... No, get... fuck off, OK? We have one last show. All right, we've got, like, we got half an hour left. We've got to finish, then you can come back and do whatever you like, all right? Are you still using those shoes? They said I could keep them! <laughs> they said I could keep them. <laughs> what I'm trying to say here is that satire matters. It's really important that we have this voice. No, no, hey, hey, I got things to say, okay? Don't you walk away. Hey, 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 fuck you, okay? I got stuff to say. You. Oh, fuck, just give them what they want. <laughs> what he is trying to tell you is that you appear to be wearing a pair of devil's dumplings. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a fresh approach. <laughs> but look, for folks who are out there wor you know, worrying about Australian TV, don't despair. No! Hey! 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 hey, hey don't shake it like you're shaking your head. We didn't do that in rehearsal. All right. <laughs> all right, yes. We're all having a great time. We're all having fun. Biggest bitch in the crew. <laughs> okay. Fuck you. All right, look, can we do the television show? Is that possible for us to do the show? All right, okay. <laughs> Touche, ma'am. <laughs> Anyway, if you're worried about Australian TV when Tonight is over, there's still going to be nightly comedy happening on your TV sets. In fact, our friends over at The Feed on SBS Viceland make lots of really great comedy, and I'm pleased to announce it now. Without us leaving, they've decided to add a live studio audience. Take a look. 
New South Wales police say at least 10 homes are demolished due to meth contamination each year. More clandestine drug labs are uncovered in Queensland than any other state. The cleanup is costing Queenslanders up to $200,000 annually. <clears throat> well, uh, that was worth it. <laughs> really nailing it right to the end, aren't we? Hey, but just because it's our last show, you know, it doesn't mean we're not going to tackle today's headlines to get involved. We are still committed to bringing you high-quality, biting, intelligent satire. We've still got a few minutes to go. You have some intelligent satire, everybody. <laughs> we'll do it. We'll get into satire. Uh, example, for example, today Scott Morrison uh, gave his first, first major speech as Prime Minister to try and chart a new course for the government. If you missed it, here's what he had to say. I'm Scott Morrison. I'm the Prime Minister and I do politics. <laughs> That's good satire. That's good stuff. That'd put you in jail in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> of course, leader of the opposition, Bill Shorten, had an interesting response. I'm Bill Shorten, and I love the unions. <laughs> Not our best work. Hey, uh, that Donald Trump is in the news again today. Let's see what he has to say. Uh, I don't know what I saw. Uh, I don't remember. I like that guy. He says what he thinks. <laughs> What's that? Okay, being told the ABC executives are not happy with the show so far. They're not happy with how much effort we've actually phoned in uh, thus far. Let's cross live now to ABC head office to hear what they think. I'm an ABC executive. I make decisions. No more can I be. See, I don't see, and it's, you know, it's been a tough year, 2018. There have been accusations of bias against the ABC, budget cuts, and in June, the Executive Council of the Liberal Party even voted for its privatisation, which I think is stupid, drink coke. And in response... <laughs> last month, the ABC launched its ABC Yours campaign and put out an ad featuring high-profile Australians sharing what the ABC means to them. Why do I love the ABC? Um, 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 I don't know how to describe it. The words that spring to mind are... I think of... Quality. Integrity. Iconic. No commercials. ABC is a very unique beast. Feels like it's part of the fabric of my life. Fondest memory of the ABC is, uh, is play school. Mr Squiggle. Charlie Pickering. I love watching Landline. You can't ask that. Kath and Kim. Rage. It's just the place you keep coming back to. The ABC's for everyone. We are Australian. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's kind of weird they didn't ask me to do that. I've been emailing people my thoughts about the ABC for three and a half weeks now. <laughs> they never respond. <laughs> tough year for the ABC. Obviously, been a tough year uh, for us here at Tonightly, too, because we're getting cancelled. I don't know if we've brought that up yet. But. <laughs> To bid our show uh, farewell, we thought we'd ask some of those same high-profile friends <laughs> of the ABC just to reflect on what Tonightly with Tom Ballard has meant to them. Oh, gosh. Why do I love Tonightly? Um... 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 um uh, <laughs> what do I think of Tonightly? I think of... Swearing. Mainly. Quality. Integrity. Iconic. Accuracy. Accuracy? Who the fuck said that? Jimmy Barnes. <laughs> Cool. Does Tonightly have any redeeming features? Um, 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 um. No commercials. No commercials. <laughs> Justine's already said that. The fact that Tonightly is coming to an end fills me with... Rage. Tonightly does mean a lot to people, especially Rove. It feels like it's part of the fabric of my life. He's, like, obsessed with us. He's been in the audience every night. Weirdo. Oh, let's be honest. The people who didn't like Tonightly are probably losers. Stupid losers who like stuff like Landline. I love watching Landline. <laughs> Is the ABC cancelling Tonightly because it's too edgy and dangerous? You can't ask that. Yeah, I agree, Claudia Carvin. You can't ask that question because of our fascist government. My fondest memory of Tonightly would have to be Mr Oily. Oh, Mr Oily. Mr Oily. It's got to be Mr Oily. Mr Oily. Oily. Oh, it has to be Mr. Oily. It's got to be Mr. Oily. Oh, what the bees. I mean, for me, I love how oily he is. I mean, he's really just very oily, and you just don't get to see that level of oiliness on Australian television. Oh, it's so oily. 
Really? The ABC's always been there. It's just that now we won't be there at the ABC. The ABC's for everyone. Well. <laughs> not necessarily. I think the one thing that's important to me with the ABC is when they act shit like Tonightly. I think one of the greatest achievements of Tonightly is the fact that they were on TV, yet nobody watched it. <laughs> That's <laughs> remarkable. I love Tonightly. Uh, I love Kitty, I love Hard Chat, I love Charlie, I love that it's on once a week. I mean, but Mr Oily will stick around, right? <laughs> it's a no-brainer. My favourite Tonightly memory would have to be when they had six weeks off. That was so funny. Tonightly sucks. Like, I hated this whole experience. I hated working with Tom. He is one of the worst cunts I've ever met. I think my favourite part of Tonightly is all the bits that aren't Tom. It's important that guys like Tom sort of have a pathway to becoming middle-aged and then they can be earnest on the ABC like I am. Tom Ballard is a dick and I hope he never works in this industry again. I'm guessing you couldn't get Sam Neill for this? I bet he wasn't available. I bet Rove is. Oh, happy to be here. No, <laughs> like seriously, I, I, need, I need the work. <laughs> Is Sam Neill still here or? Oh, too busy, yeah. Is Tim Minchin, no? There's nobody there, they've all gone. seasons here at Tonightly, we have covered a whole lot of issues, but this one has to be a standout. Uh, look, we all know that this issue of so-called African gangs has received enormous publicity. There's a whole lot of black African youths, the hundred of them in one place, terrifying to, to locals. Now, people are scared to go out to restaurants at the night time because they're followed home by these gangs. No, I'm Peter Dutton, and I don't think people should go out to restaurants. <laughs> they're cancelling us just as we're getting good. <laughs> the whole African gag nonsense bullshit has been... It's a very complex issue and it hasn't exactly been helped by the media. Channel 7 was accused of fear-mongering over this and a Human Rights Commission report found that the, this kind of media bias has negative impacts on the well-being and sense of belonging of African Australians. Now, because this has been such a massive issue during our time uh, on air since December last year, we've sent our best reporter down to Melbourne to investigate it further is what I would have said if the reporters hadn't spent the last three weeks fucking around because of being cancelled, why would we spend our last days at work actually working, Tom? That's a direct quote. <laughs> Instead, we could only get wannabe vice journalist Tori to do the story. You might remember her terrible report on youth homelessness she did for us a few weeks back. <laughs> The absolute worst. <laughs> well, now she's covering the incredibly sensitive issue of race representation in the media in relation to serious crimes. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm Tori. I investigate the newest, hottest subcultures. This is me, alternatively. Melbourne, it was cool like five years ago before anyone knew it existed. But then people started coming here. Gross. But now that Melbourne's overrun with African gangs, it's cool again. They're huge right now, and I need to know why. I'm going to become an African gang member. Step one, find out what an African gangs is. What is African gangs? Um, I don't know. What are you talking about? So, what is your favourite African gang? I don't know what you mean by that. Well, mine is Timon and Pumbaa. Why do you think people are more scared of African gangs than they are of, like, British gangs? Like, hello, governor, want to join my gang? It's not as cool, is it? Where can I find African gangs? I don't know. That was truly unhelpful. So I did some private study. I watched every season of The Sopranos and Gangs of New York starring Leonardo DiCaprio and The Lion King again. It's really good, okay? Now I'm ready for my next step. Step two, 
talk to someone who's been on the inside. So like, who even are you? Like, what is your deal? Like, what is this? I'm Benjamin Miller. I'm a print journalist covering Melbourne's West. So you write for newspapers? I do. That is so vintage. I think so, I guess. What is an African gang? If you ask Victoria Police, there's no such thing. If you ask sections of the media or certain politicians, it's the single greatest threat currently facing Victoria. What was it like growing up in the crime capital of the world, Melbourne? Okay, so it's not the crime capital of the world. It's actually one of the five or so safest cities in the world. But you infiltrated ganglands, right? I've been reporting about African issues because this is the western suburbs of Melbourne. There's an African community here. You write that the media is ganging up on African gangs. Is the media a gang? No comment. Step three, come face to face with the boss. So, McCare, you describe yourself as a lawyer and an advocate. How long have you been a lawyer and an advocate? Well, I've practiced law now for, uh, for quite some time. So, so being a lawyer sounds like a great cover. Well, what attracted you to a life of organised crime? I'm not in organised crime, I'm a lawyer. A lawyer? Well, you don't have to believe me, that's a fact. Fact. Stop doing it. What is African gangs like from your perspective? African gangs is a manufactured term. Uh, it was manufactured by politicians and, and, and the media. So you started the hashtag African gangs and it like went viral. What were you trying to achieve? So there were all these stories that were being reported. African gangs are terrorising people in Melbourne. Peter Dunton saying uh, people in Melbourne are afraid to go out to restaurants uh, because of African gangs. It was really a time when we, we said enough was enough and we wanted uh, to have our voice, uh, our, uh, our voice heard. Basically taking ownership of that, of oh, that no, time. Oh no, I'm so sorry. I meant like in followers, like were you going for 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, 400,000? What's wrong with you? A lot of things. It's what makes me so edgy. Clearly. So I'm going to join an African gang. How do I get in? You know, is there like a secret handshake? There's no such a thing as an African gang, and I've said this um, uh, time to time again, there is no such a thing as an African gang. It's non-existent. You've Ooh. not been paying attention. That sounds like something someone who didn't want me to join an African gang would say. Seriously, I'm wasting my time talking to you. I was starting to think these dangerous gangs the media talks about don't exist. But then I heard about an African youth meetup, and now I'm more terrified than ever. Hey, I'm here for the gang. We're actually not a gang. We're a not-for-profit organisation called the Afro-Australian Student Organisation. Not a gang. Not a gang. But you can call us ASO for short. I think my gang name will be Young Tofu. Um, so you guys are in uni. Are you like studying a Bachelor of Gangs? <laughs> Excuse me. How do I join your gang? Have you ever experienced being an African in this country? Like, have you ever been pulled into a room in high school and been told that you're not good enough to study your high school certificate or VCA because of the colour of your skin? No. Have you ever been called a monkey in primary school? No. Do people like yell at you because they think you can't understand them? No. It appears I infiltrated a university student group. I can't find any games. I'm sorry, I just feel really like, like discriminated right now. And on reflection, I think McCare might have been a real lawyer. What's wrong with you? Shit. Next time on Alternatively, Tori infiltrates a cockfighting ring. of everybody's time. <laughs> Tell you what, I was watching TV last night. I saw an ad, right, for Australia Post, and I spotted a massive error in it. See if you can pick it. This is a Ficus Elastica. 
or what you and I would call a rubber plant. It belongs to Megan Patel, who works a lot. So she shops online at work. While online, she asks Australia Post to put her deliveries on the porch. Did you see the mistake? Did you see it? Her package was actually delivered. <laughs> <laughs> That's I mean, that is... That is some crazy CGI. That's amazing. <laughs> In 2016-17, Australia Post received over one million complaints, with parcel delivery being a major concern. In fact, Australia Post CEO Christine Holgate says there are two key questions she hears from business customers. Where is my parcel and when will it arrive? <laughs> yeah, you're the CEO of Australia Post. You should probably expect a lot of parcel-based queries. <laughs> Man, ever since I became the CEO of Australia Post, everyone's always asked me about these bloody parcels. <laughs> Never asks about me. <laughs> so what the heck is going on here? Well, in his final piece for Tonightly, reporter Greg Larson decided to find out. Hi, I'm unreasonably angry man Greg Larson. <laughs> I called him sick to work today. I told him I had ass rot because I'm expecting a very important package from Australia Post and I do not want to miss that knock at the front door. Every time I'm waiting for a package from Australia Post, they leave a card saying, sorry, we missed you, even though I was home. They never knock. This is called carding, and it's not just me it happens to. In the one million complaints Australia Post received last year, most were for carding. And if you ever see a post on Reddit or social media that begins with the words Australia Post, it's likely to end with something along the lines of don't do their jobs, Arlo dogs, or can suck my dad's dick. <laughs> I've been here for hours but I'm not going to miss it. Oh, no! No, 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 no! I was home! I was home all day! Why did you leave a card? That was it, the last straw. This package is so goddamn important and the postie has betrayed me. So I did what any rational man would do. I put a hammer in a post pack, addressed it to myself, chucked it in the mailbox, set up a high-tech security system, and lay in wait to murder the postie with the hand he was delivering. There he is. Oh, he doesn't even have a package. He's just got a card. I've got him. Wait right there, mate. Your bloody Nick. You're about to get chopped up with the very hammer you were trying not to deliver. You're one dead postal employee. Postal employee? I'm a contractor. I get paid dog shit. I can't make a living wage knocking on every door. Really? So you're just a patsy? Yeah, talk to the union, they'll bloody tell ya. Alright, I'll go and talk to the union. But until then, you're getting tied up in the boot of my car. Sounds good. Alright, what's well, this way? It's a Citroen. <laughs> with the postie safely locked in the boot of my car, I met with Joan, the secretary of the Victoria CEPU. Joan, I was recently waiting for a delivery. I was home all day and then there's a card saying sorry we missed you. They never knocked. Why did this happen? It could be delivered by one or two people. One is the normal postie who's on salary and if it was a parcel driver, they're not on salary, they are relying on piece rates, which the drivers can get paid anything from. Sorry, Joan, but I'm in a hurry. There's a postie in my boot who's slowly suffocating to death. So here's the gist of what Joan had to say. Most parcel delivery drivers are not actually Australia Post employees, but contractors. They don't get a salary, holiday pay, sick pay or any other benefits. They only get paid per parcel they deliver. And if they leave a card, that counts as a delivery. And according to Joan, they can be paid as little as 95 cents per package and with up to 300 packages to deliver every day. Joan makes the argument that they often cut corners and leave a card because it's the only way they can really make a living. Joan also told me I should go out and talk to one of these contractors so I could see for myself what they're dealing with. So I talked to Pat. Real name, not Pat. He asked us to obscure his identity. So this is your old route, is that right? That's correct. How long did you work this route? About 22 years. What was difficult about this particular area? Mostly when uh, it's raining, yeah. we can't go up because the van is full of parcels with about 800 kilos of parcels in it. Did the van ever crash or anything? Every year, one or twice. Every year, once or twice, the, va the van crashed in the, in the mud. I'll show you a couple of photos right there on. Oh, yeah, we can, we can see photos, yeah. Oh, punch me in the brown town, that is no good. We can't show you the photos of the crash van because they would reveal Pat's identity, so here's an artist's rendition. 
pretty good. Pat also revealed that he sometimes had to deliver very dangerous packages. At the moment, we deliver live bee. Just a single bee? No, the queen and a little bit more. Oh. Any other animals that you've delivered? We have to deliver the worm. You delivered the worm? Yeah, true. <laughs> the worm and true. Are they special worms? Maybe. Never ask. <laughs> Don't ask questions when you're posting. That's the rule number one. Don't ask questions. You get a bee, you get a worm. We deliver. You deliver it. So it looks to me like the company is to blame and not the workers, which made me feel extra bad for the one I nearly killed. All right, mate, you're free to go. Come on. Here we go. I still wanted to hear from Australia Post, though but they wouldn't agree to appear on camera. They did, however, answer some questions via email, so here's a mock interview with an actor who'll read their responses verbatim. So why do you think carding happens so much with Australia Post? And these are... Those are the responses. OK. Uh, unfortunately, last year we had to card a small percentage of our parcel deliveries, usually because people weren't home. Yeah. We understand it can be frustrating to receive a card and then need to go and pick up your parcel. That's why this year we are investing $300 million to, in our delivery network to continue to build our service options, including improved tracking. All right, cut it. Australia Post bullshit boilerplate response to our questions was a waste of everyone's time. I had an important package that I still hadn't picked up. And I'll let you in on a little secret. The entire reason that I wrote this story and interviewed all these people and went to all this trouble was so that I would have an excuse to go to the Australia Post office during business hours so I could pick up my goddamn motherfucking package. <laughs> I got it. Oh, yes. I finally had my important package and I was happy. Oh. Yes. But I couldn't help but think this whole nightmare could have been avoided if Australia Post moved all their contractors to in-house employees. That's what the union reckons too. If you have a system where your delivery drivers are paid an unreasonably low amount of money to deliver an unreasonably large amount of parcels, of course they're going to cut corners. It's the only way to get the job done. I reckon if you want someone to work full-time hours for your company exclusively, then pay them a goddamn full-time wage. If you can't afford that, then fire some of your executives. Fire your social media team. Give posties a fair bloody go. full response to our questions on the Tonightly Facebook page. Mmm, balance. Well, <laughs> this image from our show is just under a year ago now when we discussed the path Australia had taken to legalising same-sex marriage. And here I am, just last night, discussing Prime Minister Scott Morrison's worrying positions on issues impacting the queer community. God, I'm a good homosexual. <laughs> <laughs> now we have marriage equality, but that doesn't magically solve all the issues that queer Australians face. For example, I'm still single. Ah. <laughs> <Aww. laughs> Can you believe it? <laughs> One issue that Tonightly producer and final show correspondent Monica Zanetti is concerned about is where she's going to raise her family. Rising property prices are forcing queer people out of the safe and accepting inner city suburbs. But the good news is, she reckons she's found a solution. The biggest plunge in Sydney house prices since the global financial crisis. How much have they fallen in your area? The average Sydney house price has dropped to $1.14 million. So that's where we'll be starting the bidding today. Oh. Do I have a bid from you? Uh, no, I'm just going to get the next one. No, you won't, sweetie. <laughs> You'd think our pollies would be a little bit more concerned about first home buyers, yet this is still the only solution they've got. Guest houses will always be incredibly expensive if you can see the Opera House and the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Just accept that as are much cheaper in Tamworth. For an Armadale over in Toowoomba, if you decide you've got the gumption in you and you want to move to Charleville, you're going to have a very affordable house. Moving to a rural town is a simple idea for straight people. I'm not here for views of the bridge. I'm here because it's where my community is. It's where I feel safest. And yeah, OK, the bridge is pretty cool too, all right? Then sue me. Good news is, according to the 2016 census, there is a place with a flourishing queer community and affordable houses for sale. That place is Broken Hill. I know. Broken Hill is a town of farmers and miners. Gay kryptonite. So how the hell did this place become such a safe hotspot for the gays? What are they mining here, MDMA? Or maybe it was this. 
I hereby christen this budget Barbie camper Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Broken Hill, I think, will always be really closely entwined with mining and drag. It, it came at a time when representations of LGBTQI people was pretty shit. Priscilla was one of those kind of lovely little moments on film that helped to try and change some of those perceptions to remind people, you know, we're human. It, it has left a really indelible mark on the town. Now listen here, you mullet. Why don't you just light your tampon and blow your box apart? Because it's the only bang you're ever going to get, sweetheart. Well, it's given us the opportunity to be able to perform in Broken Hill. Yeah. Without the film, we, we wouldn't be doing this because no. this is what people expect, this is what they want. It just made me who I am. I think that it is still a challenge for our young people growing up in regional areas. Less so and in varying degrees, absolutely. I own a house here and as I said I've got a partner here. I have you walk down the street in drag as I am. Well sometimes we go uh, shopping at Coles you know? after a show. <laughs> it's amazing that an Australian film could have had such a positive impact on a town, which is the exact opposite of what Baz Luhrmann's Australia did by making people hate Australia. So if we want more safe regional towns for queer people, mm. then we need more queer films set in regional towns. Uh, yes? Hold that thought. Roma is in the electorate of Maranoa. Its main industries are agriculture and mining, just like Broken Hill. Unlike Broken Hill, 56.1% of this electorate voted no in the same-sex marriage plebiscite. Priscilla was released 26 years ago, but I don't have 26 years. I'm homeless now. So I need to fast-track change through the power of cinema. If one popular film like Priscilla could have that much of an effect, just imagine what all the popular movie moments could do if they happened in a regional town. Oh, that's a oh. good idea. I hereby christen this. Oh, no, 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 no. That's, sorry, guys, that's, that's a rental. ABC is paying for it. But, yeah, Aww. sorry, sorry. Aww. Oh, so actually, uh, you know what? Tonight we got cancelled. Um, <laughs> go nuts. Yes! Oh. <laughs> In a world left in tatters by baby boomers, two women pursue the ultimate dream. We need three bedrooms, but no deck, because I'm going to build that myself over the next seven years. <laughs> Are you two sisters? <coughs> Scissor sisters. That's <laughs> all you'll think. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth! <laughs> also, we don't know if we want to tell you yet. In an unusual place. This can't be right. This place is huge. Why is it so cheap? Are there raptors here? <laughs> ah! Her two sisters came to town. Just want to say hello. Hi. Hello. Do you remember me? I was in here yesterday. You wouldn't serve me. You sell decking materials, right? Yes. Big mistake. Big. Huge. And the makers of those other queer films you didn't see comes a story of true love. I'm just a girl standing in front of another girl asking her to love her. Oh, those sisters are close. <laughs> and acceptance. Stella! <laughs> Just drink your Forex, all right? You might like it. Sort of. I think this might be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. I've never been friends with dykes before, eh? That's our word. Roma if you want to. <laughs> How much did this all cost to make? The average price of one Sydney house. Why didn't we just buy a house in Sydney then? <laughs> You're trying to do a nice thing. You just didn't think it's true. Do I still get to make a deck? Very good, Mar, everybody. Very good, Mar, Mark and Eddie. Well, friends, 
So much time for us to wrap things up here at Tonightly. There's going to be a best of show tomorrow night, which myself and the reporters have put together some of our favourite Tonightly moments. Please tune in for that. I won't be. But, um... <laughs> This is pretty much it, you know? This is like the last time I'm, we're recording in front of a live studio audience. Aww. It's gonna be the... It's gonna be too late. It's, um, <laughs> it's gonna be the last time I hear this noise. <laughs> it's gonna be the last time I'm gonna avoid the drone. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> it's the last time I'll get to do some funny satire. It's the last time I'll get to do one of these. <laughs> I can't believe we only got to do one instalment of Mocha Muslim. Uh, <laughs> hey, there was context. There was context. <laughs> it's the last time I'm going to ask Albo what he thinks about certain blokes. The blokes are tool. No. <laughs> well, Bob Catter, I think I'm going to miss you most of all. Hey, you know, people are entitled to their sexual proclivities. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Let there be a thousand blossoms bloom as far as I can see. You know, but I ain't spending any time on it because in the meantime, every three months, a person was torn to pieces by a crocodile in North Queensland. <laughs> Brings a tear to the eye. Uh, look, I'm going to say a few things, uh, uh, folks. I'm not going to get too uh, self-indulgent, I hope, but please uh, bear with me. Um, there are just too many people involved in this show to thank individually, um, but I'm going to do my best to, to burn through as many as I can. Firstly, to the reporters, to Greg, uh, Bridie, Greta and Nina, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I consider you friends. It has been such an honour to make this show with you and bring it to people at home. Uh, I love you very much. Thank you so much for your work. Uh, thank you so much to the... Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, to all the contributors who put together pieces of their show, thank you so much. Uh, to point it, to, to isolate a few people and thank them individually, our series producer, Margie Smithhurst, who used to work, used to run the Bolt Report. She had fun. Uh, <laughs> she told us all his secrets. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Margie, we love you. Our head writer, Michael Chamberlain, you're a genius and a dear friend. Thank you very much. And our entire graphics team on Tonightly have consistently gone above and beyond for making the incredible stuff you've been watching tonight, the extraordinary packages, to the dumbest photoshops of putting a, a dick on something. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, to everybody uh, who makes this show possible, uh, Carmen in Wardrobe, the makeup crew, and the extraordinary crew, the ABC crew led ably by our wonderful director, Sarah Walker. Thank you so much. You are, you are incredible people. And this organisation <laughs> is very, very lucky to have you. So thank you very much to all of you. <clears throat> <clears throat> I need to say a huge thank you to the executive producers on, who have worked on this show, our, our, our top uh, showrunners, Andrew Garrick, who worked in season one, who set up this show, who poured hours and hours and hours and sweat and blood into making Tonightly exist at all. Thank you, Andrew. Dan Illich, who came on as our showrunner for series two, thank you very much. And our network EP, Nick Hayden, who has been with us from the very start, and we could not have asked for better people in those positions. So, so, so thank you, guys. Um, and to all the team at Tonightly, uh, uh, there, there are just too many, from the writers to logistics, camera editors, shooters, um, everybody, the assistant producers, producers, everybody, thank you so much. It has been such an honour to present the work of this show on camera uh, for our audience every night. You are family to me. I love you. I look forward to getting fucked up at the rap party with you very soon. <laughs> uh, I want to say a huge thank you to the ABC. We've made a few jokes about the ABC tonight. <laughs> but I have a fundamental love of this place. I think the ABC is incredible. And we are so lucky to have made this show at all. Thank you, dear friends at the ABC, for making this show happen at all. It is sad that it's ending now, but it just could not have happened anywhere else. Maybe at SBS, perhaps, or even, like, half the budget, the shit budget that we had. <laughs> it, it is incredible. There have been champions at this network who have championed the show and made this happen and made it work, so thank you so much. Um, we, we have to value the ABC. This place is incredible. Um, it's under threat a little bit at the moment. It feels like that, but I just, I'm so thankful for the ABC. Not just because they give me jobs sometimes, <laughs> but as a viewer and as a listener, as an Australian, I really think that this place is vital for our culture and for our country. And if you love the ABC, please let people know about it. Please defend it and cherish it. But... <laughs> So, 
<laughs> Is that? We love the ABC, love the ABC, love the ABC, but a bit of feedback. Um... <laughs> Internightly, that's totally fine. No one deserves a TV show, okay? No one's human rights are being uh, 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 overruled here. But please, please, please do not stop making things like this. Please do not stop making risky and subversive and fun and cr batshit crazy and boundary pushing shit like Tonightly. Please don't do it, particularly stuff for young people. Please don't do it. Keep making stuff. Keep taking risks. It's not helping, happening anywhere else on, on, on mainstream, free-to-air Australian television. Please keep doing things and making things like this show for young people. I beg you. Please. Because... Look, I think... The truth is, Tonightly was a good TV show. <laughs> Sometimes it was really shit. <laughs> we made a lot of shit. I'm on screen most of the time. I'll take the cop for that. I did a lot of shit things on television. <laughs> and you sat through it. Or you didn't. And that's why it's ending. <laughs> 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 a bunch of times we were quite shit. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the time, we, we were perfectly fine and doing a very good job and turning around half an hour of, uh, of comedy every night and making some really funny stuff every now and again. Sometimes we're really, really, really quite good. And then every once in a while, I think we were extraordinary. I really believe that. Every now and again, we were making some of the funniest and most interesting and different and original and important comedy on Australian television. And I'm so proud of that, particularly over the past couple of months. So, so proud of that. And... Uh, and, and I think that should be acknowledged. And to all the people saying, oh, you got funny ever since you got cancelled, no! <laughs> all right? <laughs> this shit in week one that still makes me laugh, and also, our very first episode featured Greg Larson dressed as a neo-Nazi furry, OK? <laughs> so... We've been out here for a while doing weird shit. It's just no, no one was watching. And... Uh, <laughs> and also, the people out there who were like, oh, why do you use canned laughter on your show? Fuck you, OK? <laughs> Every night you can see me interacting with the audience. And also, if we did use canned laughter, don't you think we'd make it sound like there was more than seven people? <laughs> That's our smallest, I think. Seven people, and two of them were my cousins. <laughs> <laughs> But we made really, really good stuff, and we've also been a platform, right? We've been a platform for, 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 for so many voices that don't get to go elsewhere. I'm really proud of that, too. We could have done better, sure, but, you know, the number of queer people, of gender-diverse people, of people of colour from different classes and stuff, we really tried very hard, and every now and again, we nailed that. I'm really proud of that. And over 160 episodes, we put... To, at a time when there was almost no live television on, tele, on, on Australian TV, or little to no stand-up, for, for, particularly for young and up and comics, we had 28 music performances over 160 episodes, and 44 stand-up spots. 44 stand-up spots. <laughs> 44... 44 brilliant comedians and Michael Chamberlain. <laughs> and, um... <laughs> Finally... There we go. <laughs> Don't cut to him. Uh... Finally, I just want to talk to you, uh, dear viewer. Uh, first of all, I just have a few things to say to you. First of all, please support live comedy. Television is wonderful and great, but please go out and support comedians. There are people in comedy rooms right across this country who want to give you one of the best nights of your life you've ever had. Also, I'm touring next year. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> thank you so much to everyone at home for sticking with our show, for giving us feedback, for getting in touch on Facebook and Twitter. Yes, even the baby boomers. Uh, <laughs> We make a lot of jokes about baby boomers on the show. Quite a few baby boomers will get in touch and say, well, I'm a baby boomer, I really love your show, which is very nice, and also the most baby boomer thing you can do. <laughs> no, I'm one of the cool ones. <laughs> um, I want to thank everyone who has come along to a taping of Tonightly. <laughs> there, there are a lot. And uh, thank you so much for rocking up. There was one person, Beck, who sadly cannot be with us tonight. She attended over 70 tapings of this television show. So um, that's amazing. It has always been fun. Thank you so much to Luke Ryan, our warm-up dude, and Wyatt before him have been amazing. Right, that's all about this show. That's a, quite a bit about this show. Finally, I just want to say what this show is about. Uh, this show is about this country, what's happening in the news, generally in the world, but also what's happening in this country. I love this country. I feel so lucky to be an Australian. 
I know a bunch of people out there, perhaps in the conservative press, would suggest that that's not how I feel about this country or that, you know, you critique it for a whole bunch of reasons and suddenly you're anti-Australian. I love this country. My life has been amazing. I'm so lucky to have had the life I had and I try to remember as much as possible that other people don't uh, have the same opportunities that I do, even though I deserve it. So I just want to... <laughs> even though they deserve it. They deserve it. Oh, no. <laughs> They deserve, we all deserve it. <laughs> we all deserve to be Tom Ballard. <laughs> um, so I just want to say to the young people watching, please do not be cynical about the politics of this country or politics as you see it. I know it's extremely easy when you look at all the shit that is happening at the moment and seems to continue to happen. Please do not stop believing in the idea that we can get together and make our country better. I really believe that we can do that. It often takes a whole lot of walk, uh, work, it takes a whole lot of time. Politics and political action is often really boring and involves a lot of admin. But I really, really do believe that if you engage and you care and you give a shit and you connect with other people, ordinary people, and you come together and try and work for the common good, amazing things can happen. So please, get involved, don't be cynical, stay engaged, and please keep laughing. <laughs> please do that. I mean, you know... I, I'm going to say all that, but really, the truth is, you actually don't have to worry at all about issues facing Australia because we kind of fixed them. <laughs> <laughs> Bit disrespectful. Um, <laughs> how can I put this? Hmm. said we couldn't do it make a nightly satire show we proved them all wrong but still we have to go were we out of touch did we swear too much the answer's fucking no you cunts we did all that we could possibly have done because we are so woke we fixed the whole world with our jokes we did our jobs too well, and now there's no more jokes to tell. Tonight, lay, tonight, lay, like a star that shone too brightly. We made jokes and took things lightly, and thereby destroyed the far rightly. And thanks to me, Tom Ballard, Australia isn't screwed. We did it. And that's the only possible reason we weren't renewed. Actually, I think online platforms like YouTube are becoming more and more no, popular. I wouldn't say that at yeah, all. it probably it's has something to do with the well, ABC no, budget cuts. Do you think? Also, the show was just quite rude. You're rude. The ratings anything. were yeah, dog right. shit. Oh, ratings were okay, awful. No, no, no. Thanks to my jokes, we fixed racism. Yeah, Nina, don't you agree? Uh, actually, Tom, I reckon that... <laughs> That's great. Nina's half Japanese. Wow. And ladies out there, you're welcome. We fixed sexism the most. Because I'm such a great guy. Every once in a while, I let these bitches hold. Tonight, tonight, oh. tonight, tonight, Somebody please hire me. Sean McAuliffe, come and fight me. We changed hearts and we changed minds. ABC kids at half past nine. nine yeah. We barely got to it at that time. But at least we had online. We fixed the banks, the gays, and climate change. Literally everything's the same. Come on, Tom, you don't believe this. Come on, guys, I Tonight really need this. Tonight, oh, Someone yeah. call a shy I fixed the world. Shouldn't have been that Some problems with my job to be too well. No need, Bridie. Comedy's over. Because our show was sublime. Yeah. Now I'm gonna drink a lot of wine. 
I hung her. Oh my god, I forgot my line. Nina, we practiced this so much. I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to go back down the mine. What? Yes. Jesus. I never really liked this show, so I'll be fine. Fucking Greg. For the last time from tonight, please.